Hi everyone, welcome to uh, my, uh, the talk I'm going to give today in by ADA 2020. I'm very happy that I'm joining this year. So welcome to the short talk. And let me start by uh, sharing with you the screen, just a second. Yeah. Okay, so hello, I'm Laila. Uh, I'm Laila Zico. Uh, I'm a postdoc at the American University in Cairo, and I'll be presenting today uh, our project about specialized metabolism gene clusters from Red Sea brine pool microbial metagenomes. I'll explain what, what that is. And here are my colleagues and my PhD advisor, Professor Rania Sion. Since BIETA 2020 is from, uh, so bioinformatics from algorithms to application, I'd just like to start off that our project was about applying bioinformatic algorithms to uh, find new small molecules or specialized metabolites and their clusters. So it is a form of an application. Go ahead and check our uh, paper, our recent paper, uh, which I'm going to talk about briefly today. I'm going to give a brief intro about uh, the elements of the project. If somebody is not familiar with them, I'll talk about our aim of the study and uh, our methodology what were our main findings and a conclusion. So first of all, on Twitter, I just wrote, okay guys, this academic Twitter, hashtag academic Twitter, what are chemotherapeutics? So the people working with microbes told me, of course, they are antibiotics only. And people working in cancer, they said, of course, they are anti-cancer drugs only. But actually, in the broader sense, they are both. So chemotherapeutics in the broader sense, I'm talking about drugs that are antibacterial, could, could be antibacterial, and also the broader definition encompasses also the anti-cancer drugs. And so our main aim was to, the big goal was that we are trying to find new antibacterial drugs and new anti-cancer drugs. And of course, with the COVID-19, uh, which it's still going to be studied further, but um, it, when we talk about, it's not only the SARS-CoV-2, it's also the underlying um, bacterial resistance. So there, the antibiotic resistance is a huge issue and it's infecting 2 million people a year only in the US, it's killing people. And with the advent of COVID-19, it's also most probably, but this needs to be verified, it's, it's, it's a huge problem. And also chemotherapeutic resistance is a huge problem. So we need to find new uh, chemotherapeutics in the broader sense. Among the drugs are drugs that are coming from natural sources. And these were formerly called secondary metabolites. Now they are called specialized metabolites. And they are natural products that are very, very uh, important. They are so important that Davies and Ryan in 2012, they suggested they actually be put in the central dogma. So they are compounds that are uh, produced by several organisms that have a huge importance to the, the organism that is producing them and also has a lot of interesting and important pharmaceutical applications. So in terms of chemistry, if we look at those specialized metabolites in terms of chemistry, they have a lot of different chemistries. So some are uh, polyketides, some are peptides like the RIPs, which are the ribosomally synthesized and post-translationally modified peptides. Also peptides are the non-ribosomal peptides. A lot of specialized metabolites could be saccharides, could be terpenes, and could be hybrids of more than one uh, uh, type of compound. We can actually look at the genes coding for them, and they are usually present in the form of clusters, which are called biosynthetic gene clusters, BGCs, or specialized metabolism gene clusters, we can call them SMGCs. So if we, we can manage to detect the SMGCs, we can detect possibly and look for new natural compounds that have um, a pharmaceutical application. And if we look at the FDA approved drugs right now, more than half of the antibiotics and more than half of the anti-cancer drugs are from a natural origin. So if we take a look at the history of the natural products and are they a source of drugs or not, it was really booming back in the 50s and the 60s, but, but then scientists um, uh, uh, were 
looking over and over again in the same sites and also using the same culturing tools. And so these were the low hanging fruits and a lot of scientists just kept on rediscovering the same molecules again, the same compounds again. So the pharmaceutical industry in the 90s just stopped funding um, this line of research of finding uh, drugs in, fr from natural uh, sources. But then with the advent of sequencing and new technologies, it is reported that promising candidates with new natural compounds, they could be symbiotic organisms and they could be also free living extremophiles. And here comes our project. So our samples um, earlier on, uh, Professor Anis who was the PI of the project, together with many other scientists, they sampled together with KAUST, a university in Saudi Arabia. They took water and sediment samples from Red Sea brine pools, which are large areas that are hypersaline, so particularly Atlantis II, is actually has multiple extreme conditions in the sense that it has high salinity, high temperature, high metal content, and low oxygen. In those brine pools, there are harsh, it's a harsh environment. It is a harsh environment and it was reported in the literature that harsh environments constitute hotspots. It is a good idea to look into them for new natural products and this is what we attempted to do in this project. So samples were collected originally in, um, by my uh, PI and team from Red Sea brine pools, from three included brine pools uh, in, were included in this project from Atlantis to Deep, Discovery Deep, and Kebri Deep. Why is it important to look into such an underexplored environment? Because we can look uh, in something that has not uh, previously been thoroughly studied. Also because our metagenomic study is looking at the, most of the species which are still uncultured species. and. Although it is currently a debatable paradigm because last summer, uh, two papers from ISMI, one said mostly was cultured, the other said mostly is uncultured, but still in order to tap into more species without culturing them, metagenomics and sequencing technologies are really crucial. For our workflow, after the sampling and extraction of the environmental DNA, and 454 shotgun sequencing back then. Afterwards, the reads were assembled into context and we included 15 metagenomic assemblies from the Red Sea together with five metagenomic assemblies that served as an outgroup. And we, we did um, uh, work on the same um, assembled sequences to um, look at the, the taxonomy of the archaeal and bacterial phyla. Mainly what was done was that we looked into uh, the specialized metabolism gene clusters, the SMGCs, and we attempted to make sense of the data, so to analyze the data in many, using many different tools in order to identify top promising candidate SMGCs. So for our methodology, we used anti-SMASH for um, for gene annotation, for detection of SMGCs. We used also antibiotic resistant target seeker, ARTS tool to screen for resistance genes and prioritize uh, the SMGCs that would have a novel that would potentially code for a new antibacterial compound. We also did hierarchical classification. We normalized the, um, uh, the, um, the sites based on the number of assembled reads. We also used MGRAST for taxonomic classification. So here, if we take a look at all of the SMGCs in all of the Red Sea brine, all of the samples that we analyzed, just the Red Sea, um, not the outgroup that we include later on, we look, we take a look and we find 28 different classes and Mostly, so the, the biggest group, which is like um, usually this is the case, are the saccharides and followed by the putative SMGCs along with the, the other different SMGC types that were detected. And here, I, I really am fond of this uh, figure because if we if uh, we'd like to take a look at really harsh environments, so here we're taking a look at Atlantis II lower convective layer, which is the one with the harshest conditions the highest temperature, highest salinity, and it has 
so it's multiple harsh conditions and you see the beauty that it codes for a lot of different potential chemistries that is beautiful also with the Kebrit deep upper interface and Kebrit brine is actually characterized by having a high hydrogen sulfide content. It's beautiful to see the different chemistries that we see even in the harshest of environments that we analyze, which is beautiful. So when we analyze the data closely and we did the hierarchical classification from the heat map, most of the brine sites clustered together with the exception of one for the water samples and they cluster together in the sediment. And this gives us um, a signature or a brine signature that yes, brine, water samples and sediment samples are mainly forming a, a, an SMGC signature. So it doesn't mean that the SMGCs, uh, so the molecules they are potentially uh, coding for, um, they are, they, do they have a role in maintaining the survival of those organisms in their environment, this is a very exciting question to look into. And when we took a look at the bacteria and archaea phyla, they actually were quite different. Meaning that, for example, if we take a look at Kebrit D brine water samples, they actually cluster together differently, but when you take a look at their phyla, they had similar phyla. This suggests that this is a phylogeny independent evolution, but of course, more uh, analysis and more um, uh, studying has to be made to uh, come up with a more solid conclusion. But this is what um, our study uh, highlighted. And then we went on to prioritize the top promising candidate Red Sea SMGC. So if we were to choose among all of our detected SMGCs. So we detected 2,751 SMGCs from the Red Sea samples. And um, our uh, average uh, SMGC per megabase was actually 0.38. And this is actually six times less than what was reported for genomes. Uh, this, is, this owes to the fact that Metagenomes are really harder to uh, analyze and harder to detect, especially with anti-smash. We believe that anti-smash gave us actually a very low estimate because of the way that it analyzes and our samples are mostly unknown. So they don't have a, a very high alignment with the already known genomes and metagenomes. And for this, we are planning to use deep learning methods so deep learning algorithms to uh, detect more SMGCs or have a better idea of uh, our samples potential. We went on to identify and prioritize the top promising candidate Red Sea SMGCs. So if we were to choose some of those hits to work on experimentally, which ones would we go to? Because of course, experiments are laborious, they take a lot of time, they take a lot of um, funding and um, uh, manual work. So it is very important to identify the top promising candidates. And for this, we, first of all, we classified the SMGCs into three main groups based on their potential function. And among our top promising candidates were those in group two, that in the literature, these uh, uh, compounds, a lot of them have been reported to be antibacterial and or anti-cancer. Also, um, those with a, uh, a predicted core structure were also prioritized. Another group that were prioritized also in the study were those SMGCs that gave hits uh, with ARTS, which is the antibiotic resistant target seeker, because they encode for housekeeping and resistant genes that uh, renders them very high, uh, they have a very high potential of coding for a new antibacterial compound. And lastly, we pr prioritize uh, also the RIPs, so the ribosomally synthesized and um, post-translationally modified peptides. These are very also very important because 
So the, the ones that we detected, we detected bacteria use in saccharide, bacteria use in hybrid clusters, we detected microsin clusters, we detected lengthy peptides, uh, SMGCs. So they are important because of their, uh, they are relatively easier to work with and they could be of a very uh, potentially useful bioactivity like antibacterial or anti-cancer uh, compounds. Among our conclusions that we found some SMGCs that, that were common in groups of, uh, so in certain samples, so for bacteriosin SMGCs, they were common in all, they were present in all of the Atlantis II and Kebrid deep brine water samples, though bacteriosins might be helping microbes living in Atlantis II and Kebrid deep brine water samples um, to survive in their environment if they were antagonists, if they were um, expressed. Also terpenes, uh, SMGCs were common in all the sediment samples and also in one of the shallow seawater samples. Polyketide synthase type 3 SMGCs were common to all Atlantis II brine water layers and it could be um, if they are expressed in situ, they might be producing chemicals that are hel helping their survival, their, that are aiding their survival. And finally, ectoin was common in Kebrid deep interface layers, and this could, um, might mean that microbes use salt out mechanism to survive the brine salinity. Our next steps is that we are hoping and working on expressing the Red Sea brine top promising candidates. And a lot of questions are raised and um, this is very exciting. First of all, what could their in situ roles be? Are they expressed in their natural environment? If they are, what, what are they doing there? And uh, as, as far as the pharmaceutical application um, interest goes, we, we want to test the Red Sea brine specialized metabolites against bacteria and cancer cells and determine if they have antibacterial and anti-cancer activities. So with this, I'd like to, uh, first of all, I'm very happy to be here with you. And it's very exciting. So our study, as well as I'm sure um, uh, a lot of studies, it's interesting that you start off with um, a, an algorithm or an application that opens a lot of questions and opens a lot of um, um, research points that could be pursued further and further. So I leave you with this quote uh, of William Anders who said, we came all this way to explore the moon and the most important thing is that we discovered the earth. So you start off with something, then you discover something uh, even more um, interesting. And with this, I'd like to thank so much um, uh, the PI of the project and my PhD advisor, Professor Rania Siam. I'd like to uh, thank so much my co-authors, Mustafa and uh, Mohammed, and also uh, this project uh, uh, and the scholarship and research grants I have received in my university earlier that have enabled me to complete uh, this study. And with this, I'd like to thank you so much for joining me today, listening to the talk. Please reach out, if, check out our paper, send me if you have any questions or we can discuss similar projects, we can uh, work together and uh, see you in BIETA 2020, all the rest of the agenda. I'd be very happy to uh, answer any of, the quest of your questions and uh, have a nice conference uh, ahead. Okay, bye-bye.